Okay, my name is Ernest Flagg. I'm with Flagg and Associates. Our links are below. Our focus is small business development, specifically online businesses, home-based businesses, and also home care businesses such as adult foster care homes, home uh, care, home health agencies, and also personal care homes. And personal care homes and adult foster care homes are pretty much the same. It's uh, just pretty much dependent on the, it really depends on the state in which you live in, the environment you, you are in. They, they're used pretty much interchangeably. We will be focusing on, in this video, the disaster preparedness plan. I have Frederick on the line, and uh, he's with, been with me for a number of years in helping to develop businesses and businesses for numerous uh, people and various types of businesses. So he'll be weighing in on some of these questions and some of these topics that we'll be covering. Um, with the disaster preparedness plan, uh, Frederick, the plan needs to be approved by somebody uh, responsible for the facility's operation, by a person legally responsible for the facility's operation. That's correct. I would like to uh, add something. In some states it's called disaster preparedness plan. In other states it may be called emergency preparedness plan. Okay, okay, okay. I've actually heard it even re re referred to as the uh, emergency evacuation plan as well. Yeah. This really, uh, this, this particular plan, I mean you got people living in a home and you're caring for these individuals, they're elderly um, or, de or, or, or have some type of cognitive uh, deficiency. So there needs to be a plan in place should something happen, okay? Should something happen and there needs to be some plan in place. Many things can happen and so the plan needs to be based off of a hypothetical, the what if, what if this and what if that and you need to have some process in place um, that really says this is what we're going to do in this case and that process needs to be uh, rehearsed and rehearsed regularly by the common employees in the facility. That ensures that these processes stay in place and fresh in the person's mind uh, should that specific disaster occur and we know that in, in, in cases of emergency uh, or emergencies, you know, people can panic and however to minimize that panic or possibly exonerate it in a uh, total negated in, uh, in, in totality just not to even have it, you know, the best thing to be is to be prepared and so many agencies across states want to see that you have a disaster preparedness plan in place to address these emergency situations uh, when they come about or should they come about. Um, speaking specifically of the plan, Frederick, can you talk about some of the elements that, uh, or the hypothetical situations that need to be discussed, included in the plan, but also uh, planned out? Yeah, um, the first thing is that the owner of the provider has to identify a person who has the uh, primary responsibility for the rehearsals and implementation of the plan. And second, the plan should include emergency situations to be addressed. And the most obvious one is fire. And then we have explosions, bump scare, a missing resident, 24 hours on an unauthorized LOA, the interruption of uh, utility services, there are floods in the home, severe weather, tornadoes, watch, tornado warnings, and if the facility is damaged. Now, and I know with LOA, and LOA meaning leave of absence, residents leave, and in some instances, 
when they're unauthorized, you know, you have to do something about it. You just can't, you know, you you, you just can't let this uh, individual go uh, go missing or go unknown as to where this individual is. So you have to figure out a policy or procedure to, you know, handle and to address that situation, whether you notify the family, whether you attempt to go out looking for the individual, whether you notify the police. You have to have something in place as to what you're going to do in an effort to attempt to locate this individual. Um, yeah. I know we used to do also is to call the um, area hospital emergency rooms. Right. To see if a person by that name has been admitted to the emergency room. Yeah, in a lot of instances, our, our residents, some of our residents did return, in some of the programs we operated, they did return to the emergency department or to the uh, crisis center for, for treatment because they were out in the community and they happened to have had a breakdown. Yeah. I want to also... Specifically, uh, a key point with the missing person for those providers who may have age population and they may have... Alzheimer's, if right. they wander away from the home, they should immediately get on top of it, call the police, and do all of the other step-by-step -step missing person reports. I just want to emphasize that. Okay, and, and these are hypotheticals. He went over a number of uh, elements that need to be included in the plan. These are hypothetical situations and you kind of just got to write it out and write it uh, and develop that program in a way that explains how these situations will be handled and uh, uh, should they come up, they come about. Uh, missing residents, you spoke, if uh, uh, you might have it in your plan. I remember we had uh, in one plan developed, uh, in, in our plan we developed that if they were gone for 24 hours they were, and we, and we did not know where they were, that would be considered a missing person and we would handle that based off our protocol for a missing person. Mm -hmm. These situations may never occur, Frederick. They may never occur, but it's important to have these simulated situations so that the staff is clear and also as necessary, the residents must of the procedure, especially in case of a of a fire, in case of um, tornado watch. You said the word simulated, and all, and also I see here you got another point: rehearsals. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, rehearsal of what? Rehearsals of the uh, plan. Each one of those emergency situations. For example, fire drill, simulated fires, having drill, drills for that. What should the staff members do? What should the residents do? And I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of you, but in most states, those fire drills or rehearsals are required to be conducted quarterly each year. Some of the others, maybe biannual. So it's important to be familiar with the rules of the state. And there must be documentation of those rehearsals. Okay, okay. And the outcome also, I can recall, we also documented the outcome of those rehearsals. Uh, if uh, And, and kind of had some forms that would give us a score and scores on whether or not we were operating uh, based off the population we had, uh, we were servicing, and the number of individuals there uh, in the home and the number of staff members. It would give us like a raw score uh, and give us an idea as to how we are functioning, whether we're functioning uh, good, uh, bad, or well in, in such a, we, whether, whether or not we would function good, bad, or well um, you know, or exemplary in in, a, in in one of these emergencies. Yes, and also there were times. You know, what time the drill started, what time, how long did it take, what time the drill stopped. Okay, okay. And that's important. 
in emergency situations, time, timeliness. Were they planned or, or scheduled? They were unannounced. Unannounced to the staff, unannounced to the resident. It was typically two people doing it. It was the person responsible for the rehearsal. Okay. So that may be the administrator and then the staff member. And they were unannounced. Okay. And once we were convinced that the staff members were clear on the procedure, especially during the third shift, the midnight shift, it was where the staff member would conduct the drill. The administrator would refuse the documentation to assess it to see if there was necessity for improvement. Were there, why, why specifically on the midnight shift? I, I noticed you hone in on that. Well, you know, the administrators typically for the first and second shift. Third shift is typically the sleeping hours and the administrator may have started off with that, but we didn't have the administrator reporting there. Right. Here we go. Right. At three o'clock in the morning. Right, right. What um what other elements uh, or uh, written procedures uh, should a uh, disaster preparedness plan uh, contain, for, uh, Frederick? Um, my name is Ernest. Again, my name is Ernest Flag. We got Frederick on the phone. Our company is FlagAssociates.com. We have links below. Our focus is small business development, specifically online businesses, home-based businesses, and also healthcare businesses. Now, the specific healthcare businesses in which we focus upon happen to be personal care homes, adult foster care homes, child care facilities, uh, home care, home health agencies, and durable medical equipment supply companies. This particular video focuses on disaster plans that can uh, that are necessary in residential facilities such as adult foster care homes, personal care homes. People have to have these this particular model in their plan. Um, we develop these these uh, program materials for individuals. We have a set of pre-written program materials in which uh, you can uh, you can purchase and uh, you know get those documents and if you're savvy enough you can manipulate those documents and draft them and edit them and tailor them yourself and uh, or you, you don't have to even bother with that you can retain us and we will uh, drive your project from start to finish for you and uh, we'll we'll edit and devise the content and uh, you know and have it to meet the standards for the state in which you're applying for our we are based in Michigan However, we license in all uh, 50 states. Uh, Fred, that last question that uh, I want to address, and it's not the last, but it was the last one I brought up. Uh, does the plan, what does the, what other procedures should the plan include to your knowledge? Uh, the procedures would be, the first thing is to you know, in case we the drill is uh, beginning, you know, in case of a fire, you would set off the uh, detectors, mm -hmm. the fire detectors, mm -hmm. signal that. Um, and then in a public situation, like bomb threats, telephone, you know, if one calls in a bomb threat, um, you wouldn't announce that, you know, you never would scream out to the resident. Bomb threat, you know, where it will startle them. But you would have a designated place for them to gather for all of those drills. If it's outside or if it's in the home. And then you would stay there until, you know, it was received clearance. 
that it's safe to move about in the home. And then thereafter, you know, just return back to the normal functioning of the home if the property has not been damaged severely. If the property has been damaged severely, it may be necessary for placement transfer to some other location. If you have more than one home, you can make arrangements for them to be placed in those homes until the repairs have been made on the uh, the property. Assuming, uh, right, assuming it was an actual fire or damage yeah. to the facility. I want to go back uh, for a moment. And also, go ahead. Just one thing, if you have an emergency bag where they can take that with them if the situation occurs, and even on the drill, the emergency bag should be taken by the staff member out of home or to the safe location. And those emergency bags should contain first aid kits, um, gloves. Um, each resident's emergency uh, contact form with the medications on it. Like profile information for each resident. Yeah, and telephone numbers uh, for the administrator so that the administrator can be contacted. And then uh, gloves and a sock, and maybe those, uh, I don't know, the safety blankets. Yeah, like uh, warming oh, blankets. Ponchos. Yeah, pon ponchos. ponchos, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. those. I think I said a first aid kit, correct? Yeah, first aid kit, yeah. possibly a defibrillator, mm -hmm. uh, first aid, you know. But essential supplies is what you're saying for uh, managing an emergency or uh, maybe some water, some dry food, uh, flashlight, emergency radio, some flares. And uh, obviously the uh, cell phone. And, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, some type of backup phone. I want to go back for a moment, Fred. You you mentioned about damage to the facility. I just want to add that, you know, this is this is a section that really would just have information in it, you know, that describes, you know, if there's problems with plumbing, roofing, electrical, who you're going to call, you know, if, uh, for carpentry, for uh, carpet, for installing doors, for fixing toilets. Electrical, who are you going to call? Basically, an area that's built up off of contact information for uh, and resource information for uh, handymen or people to call should something happen to the uh, facility, you know, from a constructual or mechanical uh, standpoint. Also, I want to say that other procedures that we might want to include in your plan is assignment of responsibilities to uh, certain staff members during uh, one of these hypothetical situations, during an emergency, uh, what role will each staff member play? And that should be, you know, written in advance. Uh, uh, what it should be written in advance. Emergency energy sources, do we have that? That should be addressed. Uh, alternative living arrangement. What happens if it's really a fire? And, or uh, such a severe flood in the, in the home, you just can't come back for whatever reason. Where are the residents going to be housed? Where can the state, the loved ones, where will they go to find their brother, their sister, their uncle, their mama? You know, uh, whether it be a hotel, that needs to be identified in the plan uh, as well. And even a primary location uh, around the home, such as that fire hydrant across the street or that tree in the backyard, uh, need to be identified in the plan early on uh, as the meeting location or designated spot where all residents and staff will meet uh, in the event of a, a true fire, true flood, or a situation that requires the evacuation of the home. That needs to be spelled out as well in the plan. 
other procedures or that need to be included in the plan is notifying of attending physician and responsible party. If I got a guardian, you gotta call my you gotta call my people and let them know what's going on. You gotta call my family or my guardian would be could be a company and let them know what just happened uh, to me and uh, the availability of appropriate records. You know. You know what other records or employee records or resident records? How will they? How will we get access to that information? How do you have backup records? How will access to that information be uh, insured? Uh, keeping in mind, I mean, do you when during evacuation do you plan for the residents or the staff to grab those records as well? Is that what you're going to do? Um, is that really even reasonable to do? Yeah, but anyway, something that speaks to the employee records and the resident records that are maintained within the home, how will those be, how will access to that information be uh, ensured uh, during an evacuation or the total demolish, uh, demolition or, you know, uh, of, of the property if that happens. Does the plan out, outline uh, frequency of rehearsals? As Fred indicated, it definitely needs to outline how often these rehearsals will be done. They definitely need to be uh, unannounced um, if, in order for them to be effective and uh, to be effective. Does the plan, uh, we got another point in here Frederick, you see number seven you put down there? Uh, a, is the plan contingent on services, resources of other agencies, facilities? Yeah. And some written agreement with each one of those agencies or facilities have to be attached to the plan. So that means if you don't have an agreement with an area motel, then you know you have to attach that agreement to the plan to the state. Okay. And the last thing I want to mention, Frederick, is that the plan should indicate whether or not such incidents would drive uh, the need for an incident report and, uh, and uh, how that incident and who should get that incident report. And also, uh, like you said, you mentioned the performance of the employees during that whole fire, uh, that whole fire, that evacuation on that bomb scare or that uh, drill, that emergency drill, be it a fire, explosion, or bomb threat, their performance is looked at, evaluated, and, con and, and good constructive feedback be provided to them uh, at the end of that particular drill that's being conducted. Um, say quarterly, uh, I would say quarterly, it's being conducted quarterly, is important to occur. Yes. That, um, the real situation occurs where obviously if someone is injured, uh, if severe damage residents have to be transferred, incident reports must be done and sent to the appropriate stakeholders. Okay. The state, the placement agency, the guardian. Yeah. Well, Frederick, I think we, we kind of summarized and talked about the importance of the disaster preparedness plan, uh, but also uh, some of the basic information about what it should contain and uh, and how it should be constructed uh, was also covered here. I'm, I'm, if you're comfortable, I'm going to conclude this particular video here. Uh, if you got any questions, you can give us a call. Our number is 800-214-2611. You can go to our website and also sign up for uh, free consultation and we can help talk you through your business project, be it an adult foster care home, personal care home, home health, home care agency, online or home-based business we can give you advice on how to get it started you can also uh, leave comments below 
Again, my name is Ernest Flagg, and this is Frederick that's on the line. And uh, you shall, uh, we'll see you in the next video. There's one thing I want to ask, uh, Ernest. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. They should have an um, evacuation plan, a drawing of the evacuation plan for each one of the bedrooms of the kitchen, the living room, if the emergency occurs here. You know, a drawing of that so that each resident knows that they're in their room, this is the exit route. If you're in the kitchen, this is the exit route. So people will not be bumping into each other. And the director staff should never holler, holler, fire. When they're doing the drills or in a real emergency situation or fire situation. Because the only thing that can really do is to frighten people. Okay. And create disruption. Okay. And uh, I think you, I think that was a very good addition as well. So we'll conclude here, Frederick, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you in the uh, next video.